You know, last week, alhamdulillah, we were talking about a particular uh, hadith about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where he mentions a certain few signs before the day of Qiyamah. Okay, and then in there he mentioned that ilm will be lifted and jahalat will become widespread. Now, I mentioned a particular riwayat therein. It was actually a saying of Abu Dardar radiallahu anhu, but there is actually a hadith of exactly the same text, where he mentions sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He mentions that. أغضو عالما أو متعلما أو مستمعا أو محبا ولا تكن الخامسة. What he صلى الله عليه وسلم what did he say? He mentioned أغضو عالما become a scholar أو متعلما أو or become a student أو مستمعا or become ones that listens to the دروس of scholars أو محبا or become just that individual who at least holds some love for the people of knowledge. وَلَا تَكُنِ الْخَامِسَةِ But don't become from the fifth category, فَتَهْلِكْ Otherwise, what will happen is, you will destroy yourself. You will become destroyed, you will be destroyed. حَلَاكَتْ مِنْ پَرْجَوْ گے So what he, صلى الله عليه وسلم, he could have used a number of words. He could have said, for example, now, he could have used a number of Amr words. Like Abu Darda, he mentions كُنْ عَالِمًا But the word of the Prophet, صلى الله عليه وسلم, أُغْدُوا عَالِمًا Now, this doesn't mean a lot to a lot of us. Now, let me just try and break it down and explain. Ghada yaghdu in Arabic means to do something very early. Does anyone know what they call lunch in Arabic? No? Ghada. It's the first thing you have, first food you have after, like they say, doper ka khana. So as soon as after zawal, afternoon, the first thing you eat is ghada. Similarly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions, la ghadwatun aw rawhatun fi sabilillah khayru minna dunya wa ma fiha. Just I'm looking at this word ghadwa, that one morning or evening in the path of Allah is better than dunya mafia, wherever it is in the world, wherever it contains. I'm explaining this word ghada, because the Prophet also mentioned ughdu aliman. Why didn't he say kun aliman? Because they both mean the same thing. In Arabic, they both mean the same. If you translate it, it seems the same. But in Arabic, the khasiyat is, whenever you want to look at, if you look at the root word of something, it gives you an extra meaning and understanding of the word. Or, or, or and of the hadith. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he mentioned أغدو عالما. Why? But as I mentioned, غدا is the food you first eat afternoon. And غدوة is the first part of the day between, between the طلوي uh, after, uh, what's it called? Uh, the, the beginning of when the sun appears in the sky. Okay? When literally the Fajr time starts until the rising of the sun. That period in Arabic is known as غدوة. Okay, does everyone kind of understand that? The word ghadwa means that. So from, the, from there comes the word ghada yaghdu, which means to do something, but not do, don't become. Become at what? This is the question. Ughdu aliman. Yani, from your very, from, the, from as young as you can, we get an ishara from this. We're getting an indication from this particular hadith that Abu sallallahu alayhi wa is indicating that if you want to study, ughdu alim, become an alim. In such a way that you learn, you become, you become an alim in a young age. Or muta'aliman, or you become a student. Now, subhanallah, let, obviously now, some of us, perhaps, the things which we learned when we were young, they've stuck with us even till now. The things, perhaps, that you learned 10 years or 20 years ago, you may have forgotten those, but the things you learned when you were growing up, they stick with you forever. I'll come to this in a second. Or he mentions, if we, if, we, if we can't become a scholar, then become a student. Or at least acquaint yourself, listen to the words of Allah, listen to the words of Rasulullah, acquaint yourself with knowledge. Or become such that you love the people of knowledge. Or Don't become a fifth category because then you'll destroy yourself. But the thing which I'm trying to point out here, I'm trying to explain what I'm trying to explain. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means to do something very early on. Now we know Islam encouraged learning. The question is when? When should we start learning? When should we start teaching? There's no one size fits all approach. By what age do children should start praying namaz from? Anyone? From the age of seven. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned Muru awladakum bis salah wa hum abna wa sabah. When your children reach seven, get them to pray. And if they reach 10 and they don't fail and they fail to pray salah, at that time then you reprimand them and make them pray. You make them pray. 
Because this is the hukum of Allah. Why? Because if they start becoming relaxed in the ahkam of Allah, it will start creeping into other areas of their life. If they cannot uphold salah, which is the most important fard after iman, what can ultimately happen is they can start breaking the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from a young age, we nurture them to think that they have to fulfill the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look in history, different people have achieved different things in terms of knowledge throughout the eras, throughout, throughout the zamana. I'll give you an example. There's one scholar by the name of Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Sufyan ibn Uyayna. He became a hafiz of Quran, a hafiz of Quran at age three. Age four, maf. At age four, four years old. At age four, Sufyan ibn Uyayna became a hafiz of Quran. And he mentioned by the time I was seven, I'd already memorized a number of books and classical books on, 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 on in Islam, hadith, fiqh, and so on. By the age seven, he'd already memorized loads. When we, my, my personal madrasa, when we enroll children, we don't take no one less than seven. Now you may ask why, why do we take not less than seven? The reason why, because if Aab sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Muru awladakum bis salah wa hum abna sab'a, tell your children to pray when they're seven, I don't think that we should enforce and push our children to learn too much before that age. If the child has the capability, let them do it. Don't stop that, let them, but don't force them. Do you guys understand the difference? It's not that we should force it. If they do it themselves, good. A friend of mine, East London, his daughter became half is, half is that at the age of six and a half. She finished it. A friend, and I know another boy, he became half at the age of seven and a half. One girl became seven in Luton, another boy became, uh, you know, so there's loads of examples, loads and loads of examples. What I'm trying to say is that these children from a young age, it was instilled within them, they had the natural shock to do it. We shouldn't force it, because if you force it from a young age, they might become a bit alienated. That's why I don't accept madrasa admission before the age of seven. Now it's funny because if you look at Finland, and you look at some Scandinavian countries, they have the best education in the world. But this is what I was shocked to hear. I'm, I'm, it is Finland, I'm sure. It is Finland. Their education system, they don't take children until they're seven either. And then there's no, you know how we have tests every year, every quarter, every month, class test, this test, that test, that. They don't have nothing. The only test they have is the very, very last year of their lives, lives in year 11, or when they graduate, like the metric year, the GCSE year, the final year. That's when they have tests. So you may be thinking, then how on earth do they achieve the best results? <coughs> it's because they understood this principle, okay, when kids are kids, let them be kids. Let them be children. Wallah, our children, subhanAllah, on the moment they open their eyes and the moment they can say a word, we give them a bus stop with 25 kilos of books and send them to tuition and maths and English classes. And the general reason is because next man, I want him to outdo, I want my child to outdo his. It's thinking is wrong. In that we destroy our children. If children want to do something, let them do it, but don't force it before the age of seven. Their education system tramples our education system. And this is the number one in the world. It makes you think, isn't it? What are they doing that we're not doing in UK? What are we doing, for example, now that they're not doing in terms of homework, in terms of tests and so on? That they've shown that it does work. It's a, the Prophet wasallam. look at the SubhanAllah, we believe that everything he said, he did, is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah divinely inspired him to say, act and do everything. If he said, don't, make your, don't force your children to pray before age seven, and that's the most important hukum of Allah, think about it for a second. Why should we then force our children to go to school? Now I'm not here, subhanAllah, to say pull your kids out because I'm not in that place to legally advocate. I'm not, I'm not encouraging along these lines. What I'm saying is, is that when we, looking at this hadith, the Prophet mentioned aliman, aw muta'aliman, aw mustami'an, aw muhibban. The word ghada yaghdu like said, it means to do something early. From early, make your children ulama, make them students, make them people that listen to the durus, listen to, listen to scholarly discourse. May instill within them the love of people of knowledge. Now, the whom I know as well, market me frad bode. You've got good and you've got bad. You've got two sides. I know this. Not every Molvi who claims to be a Molvi is a Molvi. Like I gave you the example last year, you remember the guy saying, I mean, and he got angry. That's, that, he's a genuine fraud. The jai is a genuine fraud because there's hadith to say amin loudly and quietly. How could you have not known? There you go. There are plenty of frauds in the ummah. However, because the Prophet mentioned al-ulama waratha al-anbiya, 
ulama are inheritors of the Prophet and Prophets. Until the Day of Judgment, there will always be those ulama that are on the haq. We can't say okay, they're all kharab, they're all evil, they're all bad, they're all like this. That's not the case. Until the Day of Qiyamah, there will be people. Because if we say there won't be people that will stand up and defend the deen, defend the honor of the deen, defend the ummah against the fitnas and trials which come, then na'uzubillah, we are indirectly claiming that the hadith of the Prophet is na'uzubillah false. Because he said, Al ulama warathatul anbiya, they are waris and inheritors of the Prophet. They will always be a group of people that will always be firm on the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I'm saying that this is not true, because all scholars are evil, all scholars are bad, and we paint them with one general brush, ultimately we're denying that part of the hadith which he mentioned, they are inheritors of the Prophets. Do you understand this? What I'm trying to get at is this, guys. I understand that there's a lot of fraud in the market, but there are, will be, and continue to be ulama until the day of judgment. In our, let's go to another point of thing. From a young age, we need to teach our children the love and the respect of knowledge, from a young age. If you look, psychology has this whole debate. There's a whole debate within psychology that the formative years of a child, the formative years of a child, they have the most impact on a child's life. So for example, between zero and two, the child is only very, very young. It's like kind of the, it's, it's the infancy. Between zero and two is an infancy of a child. Then between three and eight is early childhood. And then up to 11 is the middle childhood. But these are classed as formative years. Whatever you are now, trust me on this. You are a result of those formative years in your life. Believe me. What you are now, what you are a product of, is how your parents nurtured you throughout those beginning years of your life. And that is why it is so essential that we spend time with families, nurture them, make their tarbiyah, look after them, guide them, assist them, teach them, educate them, for them to become better individuals. Don't put unrealistic burdens on them because of our inferiority complexes. But I want to mention just some benefits, okay, quickly. Just some quick benefits as to what would you get if you sit with proper ulama, proper scholars, proper decent people. Number one, you will acquire the fadl and the virtue of being a student. Right, when you sit in the gathering, you sit as a student, someone, and that, that itself has a fadl and a virtue. There's a whole bab and chapter on this, all a hadith sahiha. We don't have time to go into it at this moment. But so long as you sit with a particular scholar, inshallah, obviously, if, if, if he's a proper scholar, you're sitting there, you will be free from sin. Rather, you will be gaining benefit. There will be no sin in that particular majlis. Rahmah and mercy descend upon a gathering by way of sakina. Number four, angels surround a gathering. Everything I'm mentioning is from hadith. Nothing's from myself. He will acquire, that individual will acquire for every prior reward, for every hadith or verse recited within that majlis. If you're hearing a verse, reward. You're hearing a hadith, reward. So these are some of the benefits. And Faqih Bulayth Samar Ghandi Rahmadullah, he mentioned he compared eight groups of people and said, if you do sit with this person, this will be the harm, this will be the benefit. If you sit with this person, this will be the harm, this will be the benefit. When he talks about ulama, he mentions, Man jalasa ma'al ulama, zadahu Allahu al ilma wal wara. The benefit of sitting with proper ulama, even if you don't become a big, big scholar yourself, you will gain knowledge and you will also gain some piety. Yani, fayda hi fayda hai. It's going to be beneficial. Ha, huh, now the track trick is you have to search for those real ulama. Number one, if that person, qawl, fi'l, amal, right? That person's speaking, any action, or his actions in general, right? Qawl or fi'l. That person's speaking and their actions are anyway contrary to the deen. Contrary to Islam, contrary to the Sharia, this person is not from amongst the ulama of Haq. This is the yardstick. This is the yardstick to, to measure someone by. If someone is not even practicing upon the Sunnah and claiming that I'm following Deen, they're claiming to follow Islam, yet but they have haram businesses on the side, they're doing fraud on the side, they're doing zulam on the side, they lie on the side. He is not from the ulama of Haqqa. Yes, ulama are not angels, they're human beings. But this is a rough general guide. If someone claiming to follow Islam, then they need to have some attachment to the deen. But remember, it's not just superficial, it goes deep. We'll stop here because time is not always on our side. But let's just hope, inshallah, that becomes a reminder for us all. In khulasa, ilm is important. Start connecting your children now. Let it be part of their subconscious. If you can bring your... The, if, you, if you leave your children from 1 to 10, wallahi qasam, you will cry. 
You can't make the of your children after the age of 10 as easy as it could have been done between 0 and 10. They're yours at that age. And not in the negative way, but you can mold them how you want. Once they get beyond that age because of shop, business, degree, flana, big lifestyle, then, you, then it's like you start seeing things creep in and then it's like, oh, okay, now I need to think. But should we go to Madrasa? Nah, what's that? I ain't got in there. What's that, bruv? One guy came and he goes, Monana, please, please speak to my son. So I, I, I said to him, what's his name? He told me his Muslim name. When he came, I had a bayan and he sat there. And afterwards, the guy, father goes to me, oh, ho, this is my son, I'm, I'll speak to you in, in a bit, half an hour. The guy never come to the masjid before, never thinks, so I sat down with the guy and I said to him, can I ask you an honest question? Your dad's gone, just me and you, he's in my office. Honestly, do you believe in Allah? And this is what he said, nah, bruv, nah, what are you talking, nah, bruv. I'm like, okay. I said, you know why your dad asked me to ask you to speak to you, right? He goes, yeah, I just got to keep old man happy, fam. I've got to keep the old man happy, fam. Okay, Tiger. So a half an hour just sat down, had a cup of tea, couple, a couple of biscuits, parted ways. The father, he had the audacity. Half an hour he come here, like he goes, In half an hour, you expect me to change his life? My man is not even a Muslim. We were talking generally about Islam, giving da da'wah of Tawheed, Risala. Nothing was going in. But why did the father have fikr? Because he's got 11 houses. Now he's thinking, well, I'm going to leave it to him. He's going to squander the money. Let me bring some deen so my money can be safe. Allah is not even in the equation. Your money's in the equation. And then what happened was, the moody one was, he afterwards went and I said to my friend, ask him, Did, is everything okay? He goes, oh, Maulwi sahab, weak Maulwi sahab, weak, weak. He couldn't even change my son. Rab, in 30 minutes, you couldn't do it in 27 years. Can you see? We, we don't expect miracles. This is why I say this is not a scare story, it's a reality story. Time has gone way over, so we stop here. So Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq, inshallah. SubhanAllah, wa bihamdi, subhanakallahumma, wa bihamdi, 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 wa bihamd